Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Outlet at Home experience. Uh, we are so excited to just be here with you today. Uh, I'm so grateful to come wherever you are in the world. This is gonna be a unique discussion. So today we decided to change some things up. I wanna begin a conversation with those who are members, supporters, and partners of the Outlet community because y'all, I'm gonna be honest, this week was extremely, extremely heavy. Uh, and just kind of put us in remembrance of the times that we're living in. And in a sense, we need to get answers. But before I get into the word, y'all, I've got to give y'all some shout outs because I have been in the comments. So listen, I need y'all to check in uh, on our online campus. Uh, good morning to the Parks family, the Kings family, uh, the Gullies, the Stewarts, uh, the Hurts, uh, the Dillards family. Uh, that's all who I've seen so far. And then I went over to Facebook uh, during worship and praise today, which was extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, something about recentering us on the name of Jesus. And so uh, it's good to see the Collier families, the Wilsons, uh, Ross, the boss. I see you out there. I see Miss Fatima, the Sallies. I don't know who all else is out there, but please put your name. Let me know your family is watching today. Um, you know, during this season that we've been online for now over a year, sometimes the minutia and the monotony of having to log on screen. If you're on YouTube, good morning. Welcome. It's so great to see you as well. Um, you know, we can sometimes lose that routine, but I want to encourage you. Let's press in, y'all. Uh, let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, even if it's online. And so uh, today, uh, I just want to begin a thread of teaching as we're continuing our series back to base or back to the basis. When I initially began this series, I thought that, you know, of course, we were going to talk about the, the first principles of Christ. But the question that I always ask the Lord in studying is that we can talk from a theological standpoint, but how do we also apply what we're learning from theology into our life? And so this series has been enriching and this next phase that we're going to enter into over the next couple of weeks is really going to center in onto where we live and how we can reconcile our faith today. Uh, so if you all have your Bibles, listen. I've got my Bible right here. Oh, I'm rocking the uh, camera today. I got my Bible right here. We're going to Romans chapter one, Romans chapter one, Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17. Want to let you all know that all of my notes are going to be available on the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, you can get to our notes every week really easy. Now we've created a very new way where you can go to the outlet community.com slash sermon notes. And so I want to give a major shout out to just our executive administrator who is truly helping us continue to make sure that we have all of our notes ready for you all. Uh, she does a great job in assisting the ministry and helping us go to the next level. Um, I do want to kind of go over some ground rules over the next two weeks. Um, I am going to be talking and, uh, you know, really bringing up some issues inside of our world today and inside of Christendom. Often when we see issues dealing with social justice, when we see issues that are facing our world, uh, there is a Christian narrative that tries to suppress the narrative and say, you know, just don't think about it. I need you to focus on Jesus and, you know, everything will be taken care of. But the reality is we've been focusing on Jesus for a long time, as it were. We've been having church for a long time, but it seems like we're going around the mulberry bush and having the same types of issues uh, that we've been having for so long. So it's not that Jesus is wrong because I believe that he's the answer, but maybe our approach to what's going on needs to be updated. And so I am gonna be calling out some uh, false teachings, some false narratives. Uh, I'm not trying to disparage individuals, although I am going to be very bold about the, in, uh, the, the errors in the teaching that I'm seeing, so that people who genuinely desire to be led of God, to be Christians, to be those who follow Christ, don't feel condemned when they're seeing things and they're having questions, but it's just not 
resounding with your spirit. And so I want to teach you today that no matter who you're listening to, check in with Holy Spirit. You have Holy Spirit. And so Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And he's going to tell you what's right. He's going to tell you what's not. And even if it's someone that you trust, if it's not bearing witness in your Holy Spirit, then that means that you need to go and probably do some more research before you just take it carte blanche. A lot of the false teaching that's in our church today is because people who sound educated are speaking ignorance. And so my responsibility as pastor of the outlet community is to empower, equip, develop, but also now deploy you. So I'm going to be doing just that. So Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17, I'm going to be laying the foundation. And again, uh, if you have questions, place them in the comments, or you can text them to 770-667-4899. Uh, Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Interesting. Why would Paul have to say he's not ashamed of this gospel? He says, for it is the power of God to salvation. So there are three words that I'm already seeing that are standing out. We've seen the word gospel, We've seen the word power, and we've seen the word salvation. These are important to our Christian faith. This is the basic, this is the essence of our Christian faith. It says, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the, the Greek. That's interesting. The gospel, the power to save, is for everyone, regardless of ethnicity. Uh, if you're human, the gospel is for you. Uh, verse 17 says, for in, the, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, and I want you to underline this phrase, the just shall live by faith. And so in um, scriptures and inside of the world that we're living, if we look at verse 17, one more time, I want us to look at verse 17, and let's look at it from uh, the New Living Translation now. So I first read from the New King James. I want us to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 17 from the New Living. It says, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. And so this gospel that we're talking about, this good news is what's going to tell us how to make us right in the sight of God. So we're going to get instructions on what does it mean to be accepted by God? What does it mean to be in great and, and perfect relationship with God here in the text? And what I love about what it's saying right here is that, listen, we are inundated with bad news. We're inundated with what we're seeing right now with police aggression with the soldier in Virginia or the unnecessary killing of Dante Wright or uh, we're still watching the trial of uh, Derek Chauvin. Uh, you know, we're still in the midst of COVID-19 and the fallout from it. It's either do we, you know, gather, do we not gather, do we get vaccinated, do we not get vaccinated? Uh, we're watching globally tensions among different countries, Russia, Iran, Ukraine, Israel. Everyone is, is on edge. And so there is not a shortage of bad news. But the title of today's message is what I want you to take the vantage point from, which is give me the good news first. Somebody type that in right now. Somebody type in give me the good news first. And that's what we're going to do. Can we pray? today. Heavenly Father, as we delve into your word, as we delve into our conversation and, and uh, just looking at scripture for ourselves, understanding the basis of our salvation and how to accurately live that out in the way in which you desire. Father, this, this week, it was heavy. This, this time, these past few months, these last few years, uh, we've just seen catastrophe after catastrophe. But Lord, we're trusting in you to be our hope. We're trusting in you to be our guide. It's in Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. Amen. Give me the good news first. Well, today I need to define what good news is. Because before you digest any theory, before you digest any news outside of the word of God, you need to accurately understand that your foundation, your frame of everything that you hear has to come from what we're reading right here in our text. In Romans chapter one, uh, verse 16, it said, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And it's interesting that Paul mentions that because when you think about the life of Christ, Jesus was considered radical. He was considered scandalous. Jesus was considered blasphemous. The way that things were done for hundreds of years prior to his coming, he was upending, he was changing, he was giving a new way to consider 
how to be made right with God and the religious leaders did not like it. And so the same persecution that they attempted to inflict on Jesus Christ, he was victorious over and above it, is the same persecution that now faced Paul. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this good news. Well, my question is, what about this good news makes you ashamed? It, it talks about being just or being made right. And you know, in, in my uh, messages here recently, I like asking questions. So I wanna ask you all a question. When it comes to being righteous, are we righteous by what we do or are we righteous by who we are? This is important. Are we righteous by what we do or are we righteous by who we are when we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ? And that's going to answer the question as to how God deals with us from that point right there. Is our righteousness earned or lost based in did we uphold all of the commandments? Did we do everything right? Were we born on the right side of the tracks? Or is our righteousness that comes from the gospel based on who we are because of Jesus Christ? And I want you to go ahead and place your answer in the comments below and, and let's have some dialogue about that because I want you to whatever answer that we determine here from scripture, that then has to frame how you view yourself going forward. And again, this is just introduction to where I'm going. We have to understand the gospel before we can deal with what's going on in our world. Well, in uh, Romans chapter one and verse 17, when it says the just shall live by faith, the word just means in the Greek, dikaios. Dikaios is a word that speaks to an action and a determination given by the judge who is God. So to answer the question that we were talking about earlier, are we righteous by what we do or are we righteous by who we are in Christ? The answer is we are righteous by who we are in Christ, not what we do because of the judgment that was passed down by God. Now that's good news because there are times in our judicial system in America that toward people of color and the marginalized, the judicial system sometimes fails. So that's why there's good news in the gospel that there is a judicial system in heaven that says, regardless as to what goes on inside of the, the earthly, the natural system you live in, you can appeal to a higher court who makes everything right. Now that's good news. And so why does this good news upset those who were of the religious order back in Jesus's day? Because it affected their money. It affected how they operated. They couldn't guilt people into buying things. They couldn't guilt people into making more sacrifices so that their temples could be floated by the free will gifts of the people trying to appease their conscience. And so what I've been seeing in, in religion and seeing in traditional Christianity that's not based in the word of God is that people try to do godly things to appease their conscience to be made right with God. But we've got to see in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that God, who is the judge, declared you righteous before you did anything righteous. And he says that this is good news for everyone. So God didn't just declare one people group righteous and another people group not. He said anyone who believes, they are able to be qualified to accept. Belief is what qualifies you, not your actions. Qualify you to be made right with God. Well, I wanna pause right here because uh, there's a picture I wanna show you all in light of what's going on in the church. And so whenever we see instances that we've seen with Dante Wright, what sometimes people attempt to do is they try to destroy the character of the individual somehow not specifically implying that if he would have done X, Y, and Z, he could have lived and, and that's what justified his killing. Because here's, here's the matter of fact, I don't care what his record was, I don't care what uh, he was charged with, police are not corporal or capital punishers on the street. And so these attempts to malign his character causes sometimes people to doubt 
in the system that's going on or, and, and begin to question themselves. And I wish I could uh, show you all this, this picture here. Um, bear with me just one moment. I wanna, I'm actually gonna bring this picture up and you all can see this. And again, when I'm doing this stuff, uh, I'm not gonna be able to show y'all that picture. So I owe y'all a picture. I will show you all uh, at a later time. But what I noticed from these posts from different Christian leaders and, and those who are continuing to push a narrative that social justice is separate from the gospel, they could not be further from the truth. Go with me to Galatians chapter one and verse six. And I wanna show you why I'm so strong on this. Galatians chapter one and verse six. Galatians chapter one and verse six in the New King James Version. So let's take a look here at what Paul says about this gospel that he said he's not ashamed of. He said in verse six, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into, here's a new phrase here, the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So he has compared the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Verse seven, it says, which is not another. So this gospel that we're supposed to preach in all the world, the gospel that we saw in Romans chapter one that Paul is not ashamed of is the gospel that comes from the grace of Christ. Interesting, which is not another, but there are some who will trouble you and who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. I won't be able to get into all of the perversions that I've noticed in the gospel of Christ this week, come back next week and I'll get into some different perversions that we're seeing uh, with the gospel. It says, but even if we, and here's the, here's the strong language here, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let them be cursed. I want you to hear how strong Paul is in saying this because the gospel is what gives people access into an eternal relationship with God. So if I can pervert the gospel, then what I will do is have people believing in something that's not true so that an agenda can be passed, but it not be the full intent of what God had for us. All right, let's leave Galatians and let's go over now to uh, an accompanying book over in Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter two. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two. And I love Ephesians chapter two, because if we started in verse one, which we won't do for the sake of time today, and uh, we read the entire chapter, which I would encourage you to do, Ephesians chapter two, Paul is talking about how soon that we have forgotten that we were the ones who were far off at one time, how soon that we have forgotten that we were the ones who were dead in sin, how soon that we forgotten that it was because of God's great mercy in which he showed to us because of his great love for us that we're able to have the relationship that we're in. And, and I firmly believe that this judgmental, this anti-social justice rhetoric that is coming from some evangelical circles today is, is a result of people not remembering from whence they've come. Now, you all remember when you first were born again. I don't know if you were a, a Christian. I call it a Christian zealot. I was a super duper. I was extremely excited when I first really gave my life to Christ, where it was like, God, nothing else. If you're not living for God, you're going to hell. What's wrong with you? Y'all y'all seen them. You let me know right now in the comments. If y'all seen those who are like, Jesus, Jesus, and, and, and like no sin whatsoever can ever be tolerated. And, and what happens in that brand new zeal, we forget that we were the ones who at moments in our life needed some help getting out of some situations that, you know, I think about the life that I live today. If it wasn't for someone providing access to me in order to get education, to have a shot, I would probably still be in a cycle of poverty and a cycle of not being able to put one foot in front of the other. I, I, I appreciate somebody who was willing to reach down to me when I wasn't doing everything that I knew to do in the word of God and just let me know that, you know, hey, this is not the way that you have to go. And so because they gave me that opportunity, because they gave me that access that my life now has the privilege that it does. But I want us to not forget that the life that we have right now is because of the grace of God. And in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, I'll first read in the New King James Version. It says, for by grace, 
you've been saved. All right, so this is interesting. In Galatians, or in rather in Romans chapter one, when we first got started, we said that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation. In Galatians chapter one, verse six, we saw that I marvel that uh, you are turning away so soon from who have called you to the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So we now see again that grace and gospel are synonymous. And it's saying that it's for by grace, or we can also say for by the gospel, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. And so this Christian life that we get to live, this opportunity that I get to speak the word of God to you is not because I'm so special and you're so special, but God's grace is that special. What is his grace? His grace is the good news. So that's why we're saying, give me the good news first. On top of all that I'm seeing, on top of all that's going on, give me the good news first. For it is God's grace, his gospel that we've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. The hole that we will constantly dig ourselves in will never be able to dig ourselves out if it wasn't for the grace of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I am what I am by the grace or by the gospel of God. And the grace or the gospel is not, again, just for one people group or one particular type of person, or some type of person who tries to qualify. God was extremely, now you're going to hate to hear this word, God was extremely inclusive when he said, for he so loved the world, inclusive, that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16, that whosoever believes in him. Oh, wow, that sounds like inclusion to me. Oh, my. So you mean to tell me that not only is God inclusive, but God gives us grace. The word grace means unmerited, unearned, unconditional favor. You can't help but have the grace of God on your life. You can't help but have favor everywhere you go. You can't help but have favor with people that you're talking to. But he said, remember, this is not of yourselves. And if you leave it to some evangelicals, I would dare to say they would call God a socialist. They would call God someone who takes from the rich and gives to the poor. But one thing I love about God is that he's rich and he gives to the poor, but he gets richer. It's not that he's trying to have a, a substitution of wealth, but he's trying to have a transfer of wealth because someone who is focused on the gospel says that I understand that this grace that I have is not for me and my family alone. It's not for me and my church alone. It's not for me and my friends alone. I have to take the mode of God to say, whosoever, wherever they are, whatever I have to do, I'm gonna get to them and let them know about this grace. And he said, it's not of works as anyone should boast. I love what the New Living Translation says in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believe, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God, salvation, soteria. It means total life preservation. It's not a reward for the good things we have done, whether or not we deserved it whether or not we were good enough for it. That's not what this salvation, this good news, this grace is about. It says, so none of us can boast. We can't boast. Well, if they would have just pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, like I pulled myself up, them weren't even your bootstraps. That was God giving you the bootstraps to pull yourself up from. But here's where most evangelical Bibles stop after verse nine. Because we talk about God's grace, we sing of God's amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be? And, and we don't realize, why do we have all this grace? Why do we have all this favor? Why is God willing to shower his love on us so that he doesn't judge us according to our works to disqualify us for missing the mark, but he continues to give us chance after chance after chance? Well, verse 10 it says it, it says, for we are God's masterpiece because he has created us anew in Christ Jesus 
Here's the phrase I want you to highlight, to circle, to underline. So we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. So we can go do something. So we can go do something. Not so that we can preach at people. Not so that we can uh, spread fear, lies, terror in congregation and, co and congregations and causing people to be afraid. It says, no, you have this grace, this gospel that Paul was not ashamed of preaching. And there is no other gospel. And this gospel or this grace uh, is not based on your efforts, but it's a gift of God so that no one can boast so that we can do good things. And so I want you to write this note down as, I, I, as I'm coming to a close today. I want you to write this note down. Grace takes care of your identity. Grace takes care of your identity. Faith takes care of your reality. Grace takes care of your identity, but faith takes care of your reality. And you need grace and you need faith. And this is important because there's so many schools of thought that we're only going to get a chance to touch on. I owe you all a series on all of these different thoughts and, and how to defend different nuances that come against the, the balance of the gospel and how does it apply to our life. But grace takes care of your identity. And that's very key. And I don't have time to get into the identity aspect of social justice just yet, but grace takes care of our identity but faith takes care of your reality. So it's beyond just what God has done. How are we now going to live this out? But there is this idea and this question that I wanna pose just today and I'll pick it up on next week. Is social justice and the true gospel of grace in contradiction? Is social justice and the true gospel of grace and contradiction. What I want you all to do, I have a clip that I want to show you all that I, I want to introduce this for our subject matter leading into next week. Now that we've laid a foundation that the good news or the gospel was not because we were good enough or that we had the necessary access, but God came to bring that access to us. But now that we understand what the gospel is, is this gospel, when people say, just focus on Jesus, just preach Jesus, which I agree with, but is that definition of the gospel and the true gospel of grace and social justice in contradiction? Currently in Nigeria, I have a mission called Equipping the Persecuted, and we're out here uh, helping uh, those uh, villages who have been recently attacked. Um, but when I'm not doing this, I've been uh, producing a film called Enemies Within the Church, and Enemies Within the Church is a film that is uh, pretty much pulling no punches. Uh, we've been investigating uh, multiple denominations, uh, seminaries, parachurch organizations, uh, and we're going to name the names and point out uh, who are those, those that are pushing forward the social justice, uh, neo-Marxist, woke uh, agenda uh, that we have seen uh, come full force uh, probably just within the last couple of years. Uh, but we've dove into the history, we've done our research, and we have found that um, essentially that this movement is not new. Mm -hmm. This is nothing more than a revamped version of what the uh, late 60s, early 70s Marxist radicals were trying to do. It's just developed into a new language, and they have blended liberation theology into virtually every kind of denominational doctrine. And somehow they've been able to slip it in and it has gone unawares. And uh, frankly, a lot of us evangelicals have been asleep at the wheel uh, while this has taken root. Um, and now that this ideology has taken root in our institutions, it is really, really hard to root out. Um, this 
no organization, no denomination is safe. Um, we haven't found, um, and virtually no parachurch organization is safe because a lot of virtually every evangelical organization has adopted and brought this in in one way, shape, or form. And sometimes with good intentions, but once you let this, uh, once you let the social justice movement in or the woke ideology into your church, into your organization, it becomes a ticking time bomb before your organization blows and splits up because it, it has nothing to do with um, uniting one another based on race, as uni uniting one another based on Christ. The very objective of this theology is to get in, divide, break, disrupt, and explode. And we haven't found one organization that has united under wokeness, but has created division and then has gotten completely away from inerrancy. Um, I can name drop organizations and denominations right off the top of my head. Rod Martin can talk about the Southern Baptist, done a lot of investigations there. They are on the woke train, and it's going to be very hard to unroot it there. The Wesleyans, um, we have had major, major interactions with Campus Crusade, uh, confronted, to, confronted their leadership on it, and they still don't know what they're dealing with. But if you guys haven't seen it, Campus Crusade has essentially the last five years brought in the woke movement, embraced it, and made that the key point of all their conferences. And now their staff are having to mandatory take having to take mandatory woke training as if it's part of the gospel. And we're seeing a lot of people leave crew. We're seeing a lot of people split uh, and, and leave that organization. Uh, but crew essentially from what we've been gathering is, is doubling down and pretending it doesn't exist. I probably should have said trigger warning, uh, you know, before you all watch that video, but I'm showing this to you to give you an indication of where we're going in this messaging. Today, I had to, as a pastor, lay a biblical foundation to be able to address some things head on. Again, I'm not trying to attack the person. I'm going after the error that is being communicated because people who want and desire to live for God are being duped, they're being tricked, they're being scared into something that does not exist. And so there are more clips that I have to show. And so as you can see, I'm not out of content, but I am out of time. And so as he mentioned that uh, when you're doing the gospel of Christ, it, it comes in, or this social justice, it comes in to disrupt, to divide. You know, it sounds like Jesus, when he came into the temple and he upended the table, that was disruption. And he came in and he divided the wheat from the tares. And one thing this last year has begun to show us is the wheat from the tares, things that we thought were going right as the pressure, as the fire began to hit, we began to see who is actually teaching scripture and who's just believing a narrative of supremacy. And, and white supremacy is not only referring to white people. There are black people who buy into white supremacy as well. So what we are gonna be dealing with is answering the question now, is social justice in contradiction of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want you to come back next week. And so, <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. We are just out of time today. And uh, what I want to do is just pray with you um, and answer any questions that may have come in just for a brief moment. Uh, we're going to have our e-groups today. And so there's going to be, uh, should be some information in the chats if you all could put uh, the information of the e-groups in the chats if you all want to have more dialogue about this on today. Again, I'm just introducing this concept and this topic of give me the good news first. We've got to reconcile what did the gospel say and this narrative that is being pushed by the church and seeing how damaging it actually is and what they're actually accusing the people who are for doing the gospel of are the very things they're doing. They're dividing households, they're dividing families. Um, they're, they're causing people to really have questions about the Christian faith. If, if the God of the universe 
our God, the Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, if they act like some of the personalities that were on, I'm going to say at the Trump train last year, if that's what Christianity is, then I don't know if I want any parts of that. And listen, I've had it. I'm, I've, I've listened long enough. And the issue is that when people do speak up, there's more you know, counter communication, but they're literally saying nothing. They're literally not giving chapter and verse from the word of God. I don't care what you think you heard from somebody. I don't care what you feel like. Listen, the number one tactic that is coming is fear. And that is not the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is filled with truth and God's truth is filled with love. If at the end of hearing the word of God, you don't leave understanding and having a conviction of truth, being surrounded by his love and empowered by his grace, you heard a different type of gospel. And we heard in Galatians chapter one that any person who tries to pervert or change this gospel, let that person be accursed. So I'm believing the word of God. I have a responsibility to teach you all the word of God to help you identify now certain um, things that come up in doing this work so that we don't get in the ditch on the other side. So you've got this one end where people are extremely conservative, extremely religious, extremely Old Testament, but then you have the other ditch where there is no self-control, anything goes, no holds barred. God desires us to live in a true balance where grace determines our identity and then our faith determines our reality and it responds to God's grace. And so, listen, I'm not out here saying anything's goals, no holds barred. What I'm saying is that we are a Christian church who believes the full Bible. And there are times that you have to stand up and say the rhetoric that is coming from the uh, white supremacy side of the evangelical movement. It can't go on any further. It can't subjugate any people any further. Uh, I don't care if you try to over talk me, you need to come with some scripture, you need to come with the word of God. I don't want to hear, well, don't you see the organizer for Black Lives Matter? Let me tell y'all something right now. Black Lives Matter doesn't speak for me. Someone else doesn't speak for me. I speak for me, so you talk to me. And that's the stance that you got to take. I'm not going to put my righteousness in somebody else outside of Jesus Christ. But what I won't do is allow someone to lie to the people of God and get them to not take action that we've been graced to take. Amen? Amen. Um, I have my team here with me. Were there any questions that came in online? Did you all see any questions? Do you all have any questions online? And uh, as we're doing that today and they're getting the questions for me, um, I want to pray with and for people out there. This week was extremely heavy. Um, I, I just know that there may be some of you out there who just just felt, you know, just weighed it down. I want to pray with you so that you can exchange the weight of the heaviness for God's joy, his grace, and his peace. And so, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for who you are in their life. Father, yes, these moments sometimes cause us to question is this real? What's going on? How do we take our next steps? God, help us to reconcile what we're seeing. But most importantly, Lord, I'm asking you to be with them, to be for them. Help us to be inspired by your grace to continue to move forward as those who were in the civil rights era. They decided to move forward. They decided to, to be strong in their faith and their conviction. May we be bold as lions. May we be strong before you and in you. And we praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Any questions coming in? All right. All right. And also, as we're getting the questions uh, together, I want to open up this opportunity for us to receive today's offering. Uh, I just really want to thank you all so much during this last year where you all have been outstanding. You've been generous in your support of the outlet community. And again, uh, it's only because of you that we're able to do this. We're able to have these conversations. Uh, it, you know, down to the granular level allows me to purchase resources, materials to really begin to study. And as I said, I owe you all a series that is really going to address this, but I wanted to at least give you an appetizer to the direction of what does the gospel really mean? And, and what will the convictions of the outlet community church be? What are my convictions? Who am I? I'm going to tell you all something. I'm not going to tolerate lies. I'm not going to tolerate um, 
you know, mistrue. And so we're looking. All right. Well, amen. We thank you all so much for being a part of today's interactive, unique experience. We'll be back on next week and uh, I will uh, continue part two. I'll have more clips that I need to show you all and begin to break down for you. Uh, and to answer the question, is social justice in contradiction of the gospel of Christ? So we thank you all for being here. We love you. Have a great day.